everyone, this is George and welcome back. This is tutorial number 23. And in this tutorial, we're going to talk about working with smart objects. The reason I put this video near the end of the series is because I felt it was important for you to gain a complete understanding of how raw processing works before you tackle smart objects. And now that you've watched all the videos and you've mastered all the raw controls, you have that understanding, right? <laughs> no? Okay, so let's do a very quick review. By now, you know that Camera Raw is about interpreting or processing raw files so that they can be opened and worked on in Photoshop. And in general, that means conversion into an RGB color space. Your original raw files are treated non-destructively and are never touched or modified. They are simply used as source material for creating new RGB files, which you can then see and modify to your heart's content in Photoshop. Once you've clicked the Open Image button, Camera Raw transforms the raw data, converts it into RGB, and now you have an ordinary layer here in Photoshop. Once you're here, you can paint on it or use filters on it or whatever. It's just an ordinary Photoshop layer. And speaking of filters, you can now use Camera Raw as a filter here in Photoshop CC, in which case it's just as destructive as any other filter. But using Camera Raw like this as a filter is an entirely different thing than using it to process a smart object that is based on a raw file. They are so utterly different that I really, really want you to get the concept. And we'll look at that. But using Camera Raw as a filter actually comes last at the end of this video. And I'm saving the RGB workflow for the next video, number 24. In this lesson, we're going to look at embedding a raw file into a Photoshop layer as a smart object. Closing up this version, let's go back to Bridge and start over by making a smart object. For this exercise, I'm going to start with this photo taken of the Rialto Bridge in Venice. Just like opening up any other RAW file, I'll double-click it right here in Bridge. That opens Camera Raw, and what you're looking at is pretty much the defaults. Just so you know, I ain't got nothing up my sleeve. I do have a crop here and a bit of noise reduction, but everything else here in the Basic tab and on the Tone Curve hasn't been touched. Things are obviously way too dark, but let's just roll with that for now. Down here, you know that if I click the Open Image button, Camera Raw will render the RAW into RGB, or whatever you have set up in your workflow options, right? But then, if I hold down the Shift key, that button changes to Open Object, which means Open as a Smart Object. Click that, and in a moment, you end up back in Photoshop, and things kind of look about the same. It almost looks just like any other layer. You can turn it on or off, and you can transform it, like this, just like any other layer in Photoshop. But if you try to paint on a smart object layer, you find that the brush tool has this strange cursor, and if you click it, it doesn't paint, but gives you a message about rasterizing the layer, which you might want to do later, but not yet. So I'll click Cancel. Then, if you go up here to the Adjustments menu, you'll find that all the adjustments are grayed out. So maybe it's not just like other layers after all. As a photographer or a designer working on a magazine spread or something, you're going to want to incorporate raw files into your designs. And the ordinary way to do that is to just open up the file from Camera Raw as a layer. But if you want to use the image in a composition and keep all the benefits of working with your raw file, you do that with a smart object. Because when this layer is a smart object, you can always go back and edit it in Camera Raw. To do that, I'm going to hold my mouse right over the Smart Object icon and double click. And poof! Photoshop opens up Camera Raw again, which is the genius part of this whole thing. Once we're working on the Raw again, I can go in here and make more adjustments. Like I said, nothing up my sleeve, but I think about three quarters of a stop on exposure, and then over on the tone curve, plus about 80 on the darks, and maybe crush down the shadows just a bit, just to make sure we have enough contrast, and I'm done. Notice I don't have a Done button, or an Open Image button this time, just 
OK or Cancel. Because Camera Raw works a little differently once you're working on a smart object. I'll click OK and Camera Raw updates the layer. The raw bits that are encapsulated in the layer are untouched. They are always treated non destructively, which is very cool. The only thing you have to watch out for is this is obviously going to make your Photoshop file a lot bigger. And the raw file you've placed in here is entirely disconnected from the original. It's a new copy that only exists here inside of this Photoshop document. And the changes you make here won't be reflected back out to the original or to the XMP in Bridge or anything like that. It's part of this document now. And so, really, that's the basic story. There are a few quirky details about the way smart objects work, which we'll look at next. But honestly, that's 90% of what you need to know to get started. For the most part, smart objects work just like any other layer, except that when you want to run a filter on one, like any of these on the filter menu, it becomes a so called smart filter, which is a little different. And since you can't apply these image adjustments over here, with just a little bit of sniffing around, you'll find that you can apply any of these same adjustments to a smart object from the layer menu by creating an adjustment layer. And after a couple of weekend Photoshop workshops, all of that will click into place. But like I said, there's a few quirky details about smart objects that you'll want to know up front. And you'll run into one of those quirks when you try to duplicate a smart object. Let's say you want to have another copy of this on a layer to do something totally different. So you drag it down here to the new layer icon and duplicate it. OK, now you've got two copies, right? And maybe you transform this one on top to be a slightly different shape, like this. And maybe you throw a drop shadow on it, like this, or whatever. Then, going back to the bottom layer, maybe you want this one back here to fade out with a different look. So, double clicking that, and again, nothing up my sleeve, but over here on the Snapshots tab, I just happen to have a kind of faded out sepia thing in here that might work. Load that up, click OK, and hmm, well, OK, that's wrong. So, just to make sure I'm not crazy, I'll go back to the top layer, double click that, I'll go into the snapshots, and load back in my 2012 correction. Click OK, and same thing. So, having seen all that, you can probably guess what's going on. When you duplicate a smart object layer, both layers will be pointing to the one embedded raw file, settings and all. If you're a smart Photoshopper and you have tons of free hard drive space, you might want to proceed with a composite like this, keeping the layers as smart objects, but also having separate settings for each layer. And that's easy too. It's just a different way to duplicate the layer that's not as obvious. I'm going to go back to my bottom layer here and then. Up on the Layers menu, rather than choosing Duplicate Layer, which is basically what we just did by dragging it onto the icon, I'm going to go down here to Smart Objects and use this one, New Smart Object via Copy. And that New Smart Object part should be your ticket for understanding what's going on. It's not a duplicate smart object, but an entirely new one that wraps up yet one more copy of the entire raw file. Once you've got that, you can double click it, surf over to the Snapshots tab, apply your washed out background look, click OK, and you're done. After that, this bottom layer is junk, so I can simply delete it. So those are just a couple of quick exercises to help you get started working with smart objects. But there is one last thing. And I left this for the end because it kind of ties this video together with the next one. The next video is about using Camera Raw on RGB files, which, as it turns out, is an incredibly powerful thing. But just because it's up here on the filter menu doesn't mean you should confuse it with what you've been doing in this video with smart objects, because the two are entirely different things. To look at that, I'm going to close this up. I'll jump back over to Bridge and double click my faithful old example of raw processing and highlight recovery. 
the photo of the monk in Tibet. And to make this point, I'm going to ignore whatever settings might be on this file and just reset everything to the defaults like this. And then holding the shift key, I'll open it up as a smart object. Let's say you're looking at this and you decide you want to apply some adjustment to this layer. Let's say you wanted it to be just a little brighter or whatever. If you didn't know better or if you weren't working with a smart object at all, either way you could go right down here and simply throw an adjustment layer on it and brighten things up a little bit, right? But when you do something like this, you have to understand exactly what it is that you're doing. When you apply any adjustment on top of a smart object layer, without going in to edit the smart object itself, you're applying that adjustment to the RGB data, not the raw data, which means you're applying this adjustment to the image after it's been fully rendered by Camera Raw. And for small adjustments, you can do stuff like this, and you'll probably never have to worry about the difference. But when it comes to some of the adjustments, there's a much better way to do it. And you already know this. After all, this is why you created a smart object in the first place, so that you could go back to the raw data for new adjustments anytime you need to. So let's look at another example. I'm going to throw away this adjustment layer. I'll right click on the smart object and choose to make a new copy. Since by now, you know that this is the way to make a separate copy that will have its own settings. Right clicking just gives you this stuff in a contextual menu, but the command is the same. Anyway, once I have the new copy, I'll go up to the filter menu and put a camera raw filter on it. Once I'm here, all I'm going to do is try bringing back as much highlight detail as I can by pulling highlights back all the way to minus 100. And at first glance, that looks pretty good, right? Then click OK, and you see where Photoshop is applying the filter to the layer as a smart filter, which is the way filters work when you apply them to a smart object, which you learn in those weekend Photoshop classes, right? Turning that off for now, I'm going to double click the original copy down here to open up the real thing and do the same thing. Pull the highlights back to minus 100 and click OK. Then we can compare the two. And I'm going to zoom in here a little bit so that you can look into the beard and really see it. What you're seeing now is the bottom layer. And all this glorious detail in here is the result of the Adobe Highlight Recovery, pulling every bit of detail that it can out of those highlights using the raw data, because on this layer, we adjusted the actual settings inside of the smart object. Up here, when I turn this one on, you see something entirely different. Well, it's similar, but actually entirely different. When I turn this off and on, see how gray it is? This is with the top layer on, where Camera Raw was applied as a filter. And then turning it off again, this is the other layer where you see the real highlight recovery coming from the raw data. Turning it back on, you see how gray this is in comparison. It's gray because the filtered layer doesn't have the raw data to work on. It's working on the RGB data, where all this stuff has already been compressed up into the highlights. Having said that, using Camera Raw as a filter actually does a pretty amazing job of pulling the tones apart and it does create quite a bit of useful tone out of the RGB. But turning that off once more, you really see it. The difference in contrast is pretty amazing, and this should convince you of the value of always keeping the raw data around. OK, one last example. Back to bridge for a second, and this one is the bird over Big Sur. Double-clicking that opens things up into Camera Raw, and just to be sure I'm starting from ground zero, I'll pop this out and set it to the defaults. And holding down the Shift key, I'll bring the raw file into Photoshop as a smart object. Next, right-clicking and I'll make another copy, same as last time. You'll notice that when you want the menu, you have to right-click over here, over the name of the layer. Right-clicking on the icon gives you a different menu. Anyway, that's right-click and New Object via Copy. Then up to the Filter menu, choose Camera Raw, and 
Before we get started, check out how little detail there is up here when we're at the defaults. Everything is pretty much blown out. Just to see what's in there, I'll pull exposure back to about minus three stops, and I'll click OK. Amazingly, Camera Raw as a filter does bring back a bit of detail in these clouds, but not much. Things are still pretty gray up here. Now, turn that off, and down here, I'll double click this one to open up Camera Raw on the real data in the layer. And same thing, I'll pull exposure back to minus three and click OK. Once more, you see how powerful the highlight recovery is using the raw data. And yes, the whole thing is a bit too dark, but I'm using this as an example of how much you can pull out of the sky. Then, when I turn this on, you see the other thing. See how gray it is in comparison? This is with Camera Raw acting as a filter, and then turning it off again, you'll see how much more you can pull out when you can get to the raw data with the very same adjustment on a smart object. And so that should get you started. But it should also be a lesson in the value of shooting raw. If you're shooting JPEG and you miss your exposure, this will be the best you can hope for. When you shoot JPEG, you're essentially starting with post-process data, just like we are here, applying the filter to an already tone mapped layer. Much better to start with the actual raw data, and that's why we have smart objects. In the next video, we'll look at more ways to use Camera Raw as a filter on RGB files. And so, I'll see you there.